You are listening to the Think Brick Australia podcast. Think Brick Australia represents the clay, brick and paver manufacturers of Australia. Brick by Brick, our podcast will discuss technical information and architectural case studies with special guests. I'm your host, Elizabeth McIntyre, the CEO of Think Brick Australia. On today's podcast, I'm delighted to be here with Susanna Waldron from Searle by Waldron Architecture, and they were the winning architectural practice for the Bruce McKenzie Landscape Award for the Joyce Chapel Bridge. Welcome, Susanna. Oh, it's lovely to be here. Thanks, Elizabeth. <laughs> Susanna, before we talk about, obviously, bricks and the project, I wondered whether you could tell us a little bit about your childhood and growing up. Ah, well, I grew up in Canberra, which I think is a pretty amazing city and then I moved to Sydney a little bit later in life but I have sort of memories of growing up in Canberra and visiting lots of amazing kind of buildings like the National Gallery and I think being very aware of sort of public space and master planning and all of those things probably intuitively as a kid. That's the city for it is Canberra in terms of master planning and how did sort of architecture come to you? I mean was it something that you always knew you wanted to be? No, definitely not. Although I think I enjoyed doing creative things and I was looking for something that would be both creative and also kind of functional. And when I was a teenager, I did some work experience with Hassel. I went to do work experience with the landscape architecture team, who I think were doing some freeway landscaping at the time. And I thought, oh, I'm not so sure. And then I visited the architects next door and it felt like a good fit. So, yeah. And what was your university experience like for you? Was it sort of everything that you imagined about what you would learn in architecture? I started my university studies in Sydney. So I went to UTS in the late 1990s and that was a very different kind of course. We used to work four days a week in practice and do study at night and on the weekends. So it's quite an intense experience. For me, I worked for a firm called Peter Willett Architects, a very small residential practice in Yeah, sort of in the inner west Mm -hmm. and we did a lot of like alterations and additions to houses and that was quite an interesting thing because I guess from a very kind of initial period I was working on real projects. Mm. So let's go back. So with UTS you were working as well as studying the four days. Yeah, so it was really intense experience and I think that after my second year there I reflected that I wanted more time to design and I wanted more time to think about the kind of role that I could have conceptually in Mm -hmm. terms of thinking about projects and I moved to Melbourne and I went to RMIT for a few years and I really enjoyed that experience which was very different. Yeah, right. And did you travel at all during that time when you were at uni? I was a big traveller. So I was one of these terrible people who would look at the summer holidays as an opportunity to like get out of Melbourne. Yes. And would usually go on like a two or three month adventure actually, doing all sorts of things. I think I backpacked from uh, Beijing to Bangkok one year and um, I went across the Indonesian archipelago another year through Sumatra and from, you know, Lombok and the whole length. So I found those things really inspirational and I really Mm. enjoyed the break as well. And how did that inform, I guess, your view? You're obviously seeing so many different buildings and architecture designs and culturally. How did that inform your design going forward? Yeah, it's been a really interesting process, I think. When I analyse it, I think a lot of our work comes back to, rather than a style, being really observant about place Mm. and I'm really interested in like cities, like if I could choose to travel, I'm probably a person who enjoys an urban environment more than a natural environment in some ways. Mm -hmm. And I love this observation of like cities and pattern and texture and materials and the way colours are used and the way light bounces around urban environments. So with our work, I think often it starts with this act of observation of looking at a place and then trying to kind of transform some of the things that already exist there into something else. Mm, And you certainly did that in your Joyce Chapel Bridge project. But before we talk about that, so talk to me around how did Searle and Waldron start? How did that come to? I met my partner Nick Searle at UTS actually. Originally we were friends for a few years and we started doing competition together actually. I think it was a house of the future that we did for the Melbourne Museum Mm -hmm. a long, long time ago. But the friendship developed into a relationship. After we finished university, we both went and worked overseas and lived for a couple of years in the Netherlands and then in London. And towards the end of the time we were in London, 
we sort of started thinking about working together. Okay. And we did a competition. So the competition was for a pretty large scale, like a $100 million museum in China, in Shenzhen, yeah. uh, sort of a contemporary art gallery and planning museum, which is a strange combination. Mm-hmm. And we entered this kind of just in our spare time, in our weekends, and we managed to get shortlisted, so through to the final four on this big comp. And that was really the start of the practice. Wow. Um, yeah, Nick got some time off from his work. I kind of quit my job. And although we weren't successful, we sort of got a bit of money from the comp. We got this amazing experience. And I think we got this kind of motivation to work together. And it was a real test of kind of being able to collaborate, not just as, yeah, professionally as well. And it's, I mean, I always admire people that do, and so many architects do decide to start up their own practice because I, I think it's such a courageous thing to do. In those early years outside of that competition, is there a particular project that you look back and feel defined where you were headed, I guess, as an architectural practice? So after we sort of started the practice, Mm. it was a pretty hard few years where we didn't have a lot on. We had pretty poor timing in hindsight. So we sort of did that competition, I think, in 2007, 8, 2008. And then it was sort of global financial crisis. So (laughs) we moved back to Australia and I don't think there was any work for us to do. We managed to win a project a couple of years later and we did a lot of teaching actually in that period at RMIT, which are amazing supporters of us as young emerging practice people. And the project we were successful in winning was another gallery project at the Art Gallery in Ballarat. Mm -hmm. So it was a very small project and a very underwhelming brief where they said, we just want a room on the back of the gallery so we can hold events. And we went into this pitch with a client saying, maybe you can do more than that and be quite aspirational about this project. And we put forward this idea to them that the room could actually transform the adjacent plaza that was really underutilised and become a stage so that it could actually host kind of community events as well and then have curtains that would draw around so it could also be quite intimate and enclosed. And I think... Maybe it could pick up on some of the building types that we observed in Ballarat where there's like this beautiful kind of historic building types like town halls, bandstands, Mm. verandas that kind of can be occupied. So anyway, they loved the idea and we managed to win that project and it was probably a really kind of important project for us just in terms of a small showing, I think, how you can have a really big impact with a small piece of work as well. And what did it end up being like? Was it all the things that you said it could be? I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. So it has a sort of a roof that pivots Mm -hmm. and it has these veranda spaces that can be occupied around the edge, big retractable glazed doors that can kind of convert it from being an interior into a sort of a transitional interior exterior space. It works as a bandstand. Yes. I've seen a band there. It's a kind of a joy when a project comes together and a really supportive client behind that as well. You can see that when you talk about it, how much joy that brought you. Yeah, and it was a nice launching pad for us into public work as well. So I think there is, you know, sometimes there's a challenge when you're a young practice. We didn't really come into our careers, I guess, with the backing to do a house for family or yes. those sorts of projects could, couldn't launch us. So we were very much doing sort of competitions and bids. Mm-hmm. And it was nice to find a project that was right for us and it was the right scale and it allowed us to sort of, yeah, start our practice actually doing public work, which in some ways was a little bit unusual. Mm. And I've read in some of your background that you really enjoy small projects about the impact that they can have. So maybe could you tell us how the Joyce Chapel Bridge project came to? We have been doing a number of feasibility studies for different kind of councils and groups over the years. And one of our clients from one of those organisations had moved to the Greater Metropolitan Cemeteries Trust. So they'd approached us to do some feasibility studies to look at mausoleums and to look at different uh, gatehouse building for the cemetery. And then they also approached us to look at the replacement of this dilapidated bridge that existed in Faulkner Cemetery. So we just sort of took on all these opportunities with them as a client to mm-hmm. do smaller projects and it's the first project we've done for them that's been completed and built. Not the first one we started with them, but it's a really beautiful site. Faulkner Cemetery is completely heritage listed. It was designed with these ideals of the Garden City movement and it's a very kind of iconic site. But the bridge that was already there had sort of major structural problems and needed to be replaced And the client had gone to a structural engineer and said, just design us a bridge. And they'd done this incredibly functional concrete thing that (laughs) had no joy, no beauty, no no poetic experience. And 
then realised that Heritage Victoria said, I don't know, we're not sure this is right for the context of the place. So it was a beautiful brief. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think I know the answer to this, but why brick? We actually had to design something that would last over 100 years. So there was a real longevity requirement for this. And we wanted something that would respond to the natural landscape as well. So for us, the kind of base concrete structure needed to have scale and it needed to have texture and it needed to have um, a way of talking to some of the existing kind of materials in the site too. And brick kind of ticked all these boxes like longevity, beautiful kind of texture and grain. It allowed us to sort of manipulate the way we used a material as well. So the bridge has shifts in height and porosity. We were able to have sort of hit and miss brickwork mm. to filter light, curved brick seats that people can sit on. And I think I like to think of it as we tried to build a piece of infrastructure that's also just very poetic and beautiful and is in a sense kind of a memorial, if you like. And I think that's what we loved about it with the jury, just all of those little aspects of it. Was there anything whilst it was being constructed that surprised you about bricks? We made a few mistakes. We probably didn't leave quite enough space for the brick ties that had to go between the precast concrete wall and the and the bricks and then we had a steel plate on top. So our bricklayers did an amazing job of kind of dealing with that on site. Yep. I think just the modularity of brick was something, it's obvious, right, that that's something really great to work with. Mm. But probably when we started the project, I didn't anticipate that we would actually draw every single brick, but we did. You know, Jack from my team did an amazing job documenting this building and designing this building too. And because we wanted a gradation of colours and we wanted bricks that hid and miss and we wanted these very precise layouts. Mm. Yeah, every single brick was drawn and documented. I am going to ask you something about that you've got this sort of area which is the brick seat and then obviously it sort of looks down and I just wondered whether you could explain that because I think as a jury we actually discussed it for a long time about all the different things that you could use that for but what was the intention behind that feature? One of the features of the pre-existing bridge was it had a circular concrete culvert okay. and that was quite important from Heritage Victoria's point of view that we try to reference that or retain it in some way. We also were designing a bridge with current code requirements that needed to meet Melbourne water requirements mm -hmm. where you can't just put a circular concrete culvert in the middle of a creek anymore <laughs> because things get stuck in it. So for us, we started to think about how the bridge could reference this beautiful circular cutout. There's also something I think really nice about a circle. Some of the works we've been doing on other projects in cemeteries, we keep coming back to this, this kind of idea of continuity. It's an idea of calmness. And we wanted the experience when you walked across the bridge to be one where the creek was revealed. So there's a stillness to the water that moves underneath this bridge. It's sometimes quite still and then sometimes it kind of has slow ripples and then sometimes it's kind of faster. Mm. And there's something for me in the way that water moves as well that's very kind of calming and reflective. People cross this bridge to get from the car park to the chapel and it's usually used for memorial services or funerals. Mm -hmm. And so the journey is one where you kind of want people to go from that sort of stress of getting to the chapel on time mm. to being really calm and reflective. And so providing these seats at this kind of midway point across the bridge is also a place where you could potentially meet family and friends and mm. look at the water and be calm. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful feature. How long did construction take? Construction on this one, it was during COVID oh. and also because the chapel was in services every day, they had to actually stop work during each service. So wow. it was a very, quite a long program, close to a year mm -hmm. with stop-start work. So really tricky in terms of all the restrictions, but the builders did an amazing job. They've been doing infrastructure projects, I think, for several generations. They're family contractors. And they wrote to us after the project and they were so thrilled. They're like, it's the most beautiful bridge we've ever built. And oh. they were really happy to be part of that. So it's good. Beautiful. And we were just talking before the podcast about the awards program. And maybe if you could share a little bit of your experience with it. We were really excited to have a project we could actually enter in the, in the awards. It's been on our radar for a while <laughs> and it just hasn't been a project in the practice that's been the right fit. For me, it was a really simple process as well. I was actually in Brisbane holidaying at the time. And, you know, we had some beautiful photographs taken by Peter Bennett's that we were able to put in for the submission, but it was a really easy process. And 
we wanted to be part in a way of this kind of community of architects that we know were quite passionate about this awards program too. So oh, it's been great. And Susanna, given the amount of work that you do with public works, where do you see the role of the architect or architects with what we've got to face with the climate going forward in the future? What role do you see architects play in that? I think we've got a huge role to play in these things. I think every project we do now, that question about sustainability and how we kind of make the building as sustainable as possible is just something that's part of the brief. We often look for how we will choose materials that also have a long lifespan. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily, they might not always be the most sustainable materials, but looking for this balance about life cycle and how the longevity of buildings is quite important. We also try to push our clients, I think, to be more aspirational with ESD initiatives if they're not already, but Mm -hmm. a lot of our clients are very keen to do that. So following on from the bridge, we've been doing another project with that same client at Mm -hmm. the Cemeteries Trust and we're doing sort of a depot and staff headquarters for them. So quite a large building too. Mm. And on that project, that client has aspirations to sort of become carbon neutral within the next 10 years and So the building is very sustainable in terms of like using mass timber and having a large array of solar panels. There's also strategies around creek naturalisation and things on the adjacent land. Mm. And so trying to look at it really holistically too. Do you think that type of discussion has changed from, say, a decade ago in terms of building and, and the thought process behind how a building is going to perform? Yeah, absolutely. Like I think everybody is much more aware that this isn't a nice to have. It's an essential thing to do. We also find that, you know, some of our clients base their ESD budgets on part of the building costs. And I think that's a really good thing to do as well, to say, Mm. well, if we are building a, you know, $3 million sports pavilion, we need to be setting aside this percentage of the budget to do these things. You mentioned that you lived in the Netherlands. How long did you live there for? Uh, A couple of years. I um, worked there, Mm. mostly in Rotterdam. I worked at OMA, which is a fairly kind of well-known architecture practice and was a really interesting experience for me working on a range of like public projects and commercial works and competitions. What would you say out of that experience? Was there anything that informed how you approach your design? Oh, 100%. I think travel and being able to work somewhere else as a young architect is so kind of inspirational. I travelled a lot in Europe during that time as well and I just got exposed to lots of different architects from lots of different places too. So obviously lots of Dutch architects but also that was a very international office yeah. and people from across the world were kind of working there. So, Do you have a favourite brick building? I have some memorable ones. Talking about travel, I guess the first project I went to where I felt totally immersed in brick was probably Louis Kahn's IIT campus in Ahmedabad in India. Yes. So a little bit off the beaten track and it is such a huge kind of collection of these arched red brick forms and it's kind of amazing to explore. So that was an extremely memorable project for me and I think just I felt quite challenged by it at the time even though it's not a recent project because it was almost an overwhelming use of brick, but I feel like the impact of that single materiality is just great. Mm. Susanna, you've sort of outlined and I've been, I really enjoyed hearing about how you started out and your approach. And as you said, a lot of architects get that friend of the family or family member that gives them a house or something to design. What advice would you have for emerging architects that in your similar situation that may not have that? I think architecture needs to have diversity. It has to have diversity of people working in it. And so I like to think there's space for everyone here and that's women and that's kind of people from different socioeconomic backgrounds or people with different kind of experiences to bring to our industry as well. For us, practically things like teaching were really useful. Mm -hmm. So we got a lot of support from the universities that we got our degrees from um, in terms of giving us opportunities to teach. And that was also just an amazing kind of experience to talking to other people about design and helping us to have a period of time where we were able to develop an interest in the things we wanted to focus on. But I also think just give it a go. Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in you have to just approach things with a, a level of optimism and positivity. It might not work out, but it's good to give things a go rather than regret not trying. 
Susanna, that positivity shines through. So thank you. We're going to move to our rapid fire questions and all answers are acceptable. Reading the news, a newspaper or online? Online. Handwriting or typing? Oh, I do more typing, but handwriting is probably preference. For sketching ideas and concepts, would you use a pencil, pen or an e-pen? Oh, I have a very specific black pen. Which one is it? This one here. Uh, <laughs> it's the Uniball Eye the in the ink. fine and black. Do you like to read books or listen to audio books? Books. What's more important to you, style or substance? Oh, so tricky. Can I say both? Yep. I feel like you can't have style if you don't have substance as well. I agree. Coffee or tea? Coffee. TV shows or movies? Oh, I think TV shows lately. Antique or brand new modern? Vintage, slight distinction on antique, but I'm a bit of a modern furniture kind of person. Call or text? Oh, again, a tricky one. Probably texting. I reckon I've changed. (laughs) Travel back in time or into the future? I'd probably go back in time, actually. Mm -hmm. Probably not even that far back. Exterior or interior? Oh, I love to think these things can blend and merge, but ultimately I'm focused, I think, often on how you can have an impact on the urban environment, so let's say exterior. Okay. That wasn't very rapid fire, was it? I love it. Video games or board games? I don't think I've ever played a video game really. It's terrible, so (laughs) board games. Form or function? Going to blur them again. I think you've got to do both and it's great to have a functional building but it also needs to do something with its form. And complex or simple with relation to design? We actually always look to achieve complexity, but by doing it in a simple way. And I think if you can nail that, that's the best of both worlds. I think you've nailed it. Susanna, thank you very much for being part of our Think Brick podcast and congratulations on your win. Thanks so much for having me. It's been so much fun. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please follow, rate and review our podcast. We are always looking for new ways to think brick. If you have an idea of what you'd like to hear about, there's a link in our show notes to let us know.